Hey, so in last week's video, I gave an introduction to the economics of climate change. This week, I'm looking at climate change through an ethical lens. Stephen Gardner, a philosophy professor at the University of Washington, argues that climate change is a uniquely perfect moral storm. I'm going to break this down over the next few videos by looking at three interacting ethical problems which make climate change an insidious problem. Today, I'm focusing on the global storm. By comparing climate change to ozone depletion, we can get a good idea of why one pollution problem has largely been solved while the other is still getting worse. The hole in the ozone layer was a huge issue in the 90s. More of the sun's energy hit the Earth's surface and increased the risk of us getting skin cancer. And it was caused by chlorofluorocarbons, a compound that used to be found in deodorants, hairsprays and fridge coolants. While this summary is an oversimplification of ozone depletion, this was the same story that the media gave the public. People everywhere could then visualise the danger of a gaping hole in the stratosphere. We were showed that not only were we responsible for it, but also that we, the people, could fix it by changing our consumption habits. And we did. However, it is much more difficult to stop buying products that require oil or petrol. In other words, ozone depletion was a much easier problem to solve because civilization wasn't fueled by deodorant in the same way. Also, it made sense for countries, well, one country in particular, to reduce its production of aerosols, even if it was the only country to do so because of the benefit to public health. Unfortunately, the same approach wasn't taken for climate change. Because carbon dioxide diffuses through the atmosphere, it does not have an effect in just one isolated place. This means, for any action to be effective, multiple countries need to band together. Let's unpack this. Even a huge polluter like ExxonMobil, the world's largest energy company, responsible for 1.4% of global greenhouse gas emissions in 2015, would not, if acting in isolation, have a noticeable effect on the climate. That is, if we tagged with a label each molecule of emissions released and tracked their movement, they would spread too thinly for any perceptible effect. If they were the only polluter on the planet, all would be fine, but the problem is that ExxonMobil does not act in isolation. To explain this further, I'll borrow Chrysaula Andro's analogy from the Canadian Journal of Philosophy, which helps explain the inclination for an ever-growing release of carbon emissions into the atmosphere, despite the effect that this has on the climate. Imagine you are at a bus stop and see an advert for research participants in a behavioural experiment that would allow you to make millions of dollars just for wearing a device on your wrist for the rest of your life. You are sceptical but go along to the information meeting and find that the device enables doctors to apply an electrical current to the body in increments so tiny that you, the participant, cannot distinguish between them. The device has 1001 settings, from zero where you feel nothing, all the way up to 1000 where you would be in excruciating pain constantly. It is attached in a conveniently portable form. Initially, you are shocked that such research could be approved, but attracted by the promise of great riches, you stay for more information. You are told that the device is initially set at zero. At the start of each week, you are allowed to try out and compare different settings to understand your pain threshold, after which the dial is returned to its previous position. At any other time, you have only two options, to stay put at the same level or increase the current by one setting. You are nervous, but then you are told that at each advance you would receive $10,000. However, you can only advance by one step each week and may never retreat. Confident in your belief that you'll show restraint and stop at a level before the current becomes uncomfortable, you decide to sign up. On the first day, you increase the setting from zero to one and happily pocket your $10,000. The difference in current is so small that between each individual step, you can't feel any increase in electricity. You continue moving through the settings for several weeks until you reach the stage where you now have a lot of money but can definitely feel some buzzing in your fingertips. However, you know that you will not feel any noticeable difference by increasing the current further by one setting. And that extra $10,000 would allow you to buy another car. When you eventually reach setting 250, you begin to realise your restraint is failing you. The current is now disrupting your daily life. While there is a significant difference between where you started and where you are now, you can't resist the urge to go up just one more notch for another wad of cash. After all, 250 and 251 feel the same, but another $10,000 feels great. So, you keep going until your body is in constant pain and you can no longer breathe freely. Daily tasks become a lot harder. The disruption to your nervous system means you go from freezing cold to burning hot every hour. A living nightmare, but at least you're stinking rich, right? In this analogy, emissions from the burning of fossil fuels by companies such as ExxonMobil represent the electrical current. 
Both are damaging and can increase gradually by imperceptible amounts. The $10,000 represents the financial benefits to companies of continuing to use cheap, mass-produced fuels. If such a company were to stop one of their burners, they would not change the global emissions by any noticeable amount, but they would lose a lot of money. Why would they ever stop increasing pollution when they only stand to gain financially from doing so? And the side effects of their emissions on the planet in isolation are so small. The necessary global coordination required to constrain these polluters causes tension in the international community. An example of this was when Trump took the US out of the Paris Climate Agreement, the most recent attempt to regulate each country's output of carbon emissions. However, other countries banded together and have since continued to cut emissions, leaving the US as the lone outsider. Even some cities within the US, notably Chicago, are recommitting to their Paris Agreement targets. This resilience to such a major setback reflects a change in public attitudes, from sacrificing anything for the sake of growth and a regulation-free economy, to recognising that something needs to be done about climate change. And politicians are responding to the social pressure of these changing attitudes. Another example, this time from the corporate world, shows how environmentally conscious investors can change the actions of big companies. Australian banks have ruled out investing in a proposed Queensland coal mine, which would open up shipping lanes across the already dying Great Barrier Reef. If all the proposed regions in this area, the Galilee Basin, were operating, their combined emissions would be higher than all but six countries. Yet, customers of Australian banks have threatened to relocate their accounts if such investments were to go ahead. When people come together like this, a very strong message can be sent that can have a very real impact. However, Gardner identifies something else that worsens this global problem. Every country is affected differently by climate change, and those that are the least affected by climate issues, i.e. the richest, would have the smallest incentive to respond. Unfortunately, it is the countries that have the least power that are also the most exposed to a worsening climate. The Climate Risk Index ranks the countries that have suffered the most damage from climate change over the last 20 years. All but one of these countries, ranked in the top 10 most vulnerable, are also in the poorest third of countries. And Thailand, the exception, is not exactly known for its riches. Although the study acknowledges that these results should not be used for a linear projection of future climate impacts, it shows that so far, climate change has caused a lot of issues for the poorest countries. Geography also makes things harder. Even if all countries in the world experience the same temperature increase from climate change, some would suffer more than others. A country, such as Ethiopia, which already has deserts, would lose more of its remaining farmland than a country, such as Russia, which experiences damagingly cold winters. This is problematic, as poorer countries have more people employed in farming than their developed counterparts. Agriculture is particularly susceptible to climate change, meaning it's the livelihood as well as the lives of these people that are threatened. We can get an idea of the number of people employed in agricultural jobs by looking at the size of the primary sector, which is made up of the industries responsible for providing natural resources such as food, wood, oil and water. 9 out of 10 of our most at-risk countries rely on their primary sector for over twice as many jobs as the global average. Burma's primary sector, number 2 on our risk list, is responsible for 37.1% of the nation's jobs. That's 6 times more than the global average. And no, the Climate Risk Index is a perfect measure, as the size of the primary sector measures any extraction of resources from the earth, including fossil fuels and the amount an industry produces does not correlate exactly with the number of people employed in that sector. Ultimately, all this shows that developing countries have higher reliance on climate-vulnerable agricultural jobs, meaning climate change will cause the most damage to these areas. As I mentioned in my last video, some developing economies prefer to tread the path while trodden, feeling entitled to the same cheap development opportunities that current rich countries had decades previously, especially when the more expensive renewable options are financially unviable. So ethically speaking, what's the fairest? Should Western countries, who relied upon the dirtiest fossil fuels for their industrial revolution and owe their wealth to these carbon-filled fumes, now tell poorer countries from their high horse, hey, you can't expand your economy like we did through the use of fossil fuels. Don't you know that's bad for the environment? Instead, stay poor and underdeveloped. Well, thankfully, there is another option to help ease these social issues. A carbon tax can raise public funds to help bring people out of poverty. I will go into this and other economic tools for climate-friendly development in another video. It doesn't always have to be an uphill struggle. If a large country, for instance India, follows a green development strategy, there would be huge benefits, not only for India, but for the world over. If we must make wind turbines to provide electricity for a billion people, 
companies will get very efficient at making them. This will make them cheaply available, and eventually we will reach a world where people live carbon-free for economic reasons as well as ethical reasons. In my next video, I'll be talking about another of Gardner's storms, the intergenerational storm. This explores the difficulties of decision-making when some of the people affected haven't even been born yet.